It's upside down today. Now, those of you that are visiting with us don't know that yet, but this Sunday is not normal. Normally, we have a, an extended time of worship like you were just getting into, and, uh, and then we have the Word, and then we have some ministry at the end. But here's what I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted to do today. Sometimes it's good to get a little warmed up and then hear the Word and then respond to the Word. You all know what I'm talking about. Because the Word and our worship should be going hand in glove. And here's what I love. The Word of God is meant to inspire passion in our hearts for Jesus. So sometimes we need to hear the Word and then we need to respond. And that's what I want you all to do today. So if, if you're like, man, pastor, we just got my appetite wet for worship and then we stop. Well, guess what? We're going to go out big today, all right, with worship. And, and for those of you that are, that are brand new with us, I just want to say welcome to our crazy family. By the way, all families are crazy, just so you know that. All families are crazy. We're a little crazy too, but we have a lot of fun. And, uh, and the Lord is doing some great stuff here. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But we have a number of ways we'd love to connect with you if you're brand new here today. Uh, we have a connection card in your bulletin. They would really be great if you take a moment, just fill that out and drop it in uh, the offering basket in just a moment. Or uh, digitally, you guys can go online and you can see on the, on the screen, uh, you can text us that word new and it'll take you to just a series of prompts and you can handle everything on your phone. But here's the deal. We just want to help you and serve you and love on you and follow up with you and help you find a good place to connect if you're looking for a church family and you're looking to get more involved and connected. We, we'd love to invite you to be connected with our family. It's a great bunch. Hey, let me just tell you, first service um, was awesome, but I also had to tell everybody at first service that this building was hopping early, all right? Because here's what's going on. We got, our, we got our inner healing class going on. How many of you are part of that or have been part of that? Wave at me. Uh, that is powerful, all right? And uh, that group is starting up in the evening again on the 22nd, the Monday after Easter. So if you can't make Sunday morning or that doesn't work for you, but Monday nights are good, uh, sign up at the Connection Center. Uh, for the Monday night session on that class, all right, because that's going to be starting up here soon. Um, but anyway, we had a bunch of folks going through that, getting some amazing aha moments, revelation moments, and uh, in healing, which is great. We also had about 40 people all together, 40 men and leaders at our men's encounter. Where's all the guys that were at the encounter? I want to hear your test. Come on. And... Uh, that is absolutely amazing. And I really want to thank all of our leadership team. You know, we're looking for fat people around here, right? Help me out. Faithful, available, teachable, fat people. Uh, it takes fat people to be a part of an encounter weekend because you got to make yourself available and you got to be willing to pour out what, what's been poured into you. But I just need to give the Lord uh, some glory this morning. Um, where's my man, Jay Ray? Jay, stand up. Right there. All right. Fat, come up here. Don't you come up here. This is another thing about living stones is you never know when you're going to get called on. All right. <laughs> I'm just giving you a fair warning. Um, father wounds. My goodness. You had, you had some serious stuff going on in your life growing up. Major rejection. Um, major wounding in that area. And it scarred you for most of your life. What session did you teach this weekend? Father wounds. Father wounds. Oh, come on. Wait, wait, wait. Where'd that be? Um, Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about how Jesus has the power to make dead things come alive. And, and here's what I love about the Encounter Weekend. Not that you're up teaching or whatever, although I'm proud of you and I'm proud of, of you receiving the healing from the Lord. But, but it takes something to go through the pain and uh, rejection and the brokenness and then be able to stand from a place of uh, strength in the Lord and be able to minister hope to other people. And... I'm just kind of throwing it out there because I'm not setting you up or nothing. But if you just want to say amen and go sit down, you can. But, but how did all that happen to get from point A to point B? That's a long story, too. Don't go there. But you give us a short version. Yeah, the, the, the short version, I guess, would just be uh, when, I, when I came here, you know, I grew up church. You know, I was at church always uh, for like 30 years, right? And then uh, I come here and I go to the encounter and, and, I, and the guys that I, I spoke to the other day will, will hear this again. I, I've been to tons of these things, right? Like I've been to tons of youth things, tons of men's things. And it's like I kind of was going through the motions a little bit. But then when I realized that these guys that I see every Sunday that are, that are worshiping up here, that are leading in different areas were 
just as screwed up, if not more screwed up, <laughs> than I was, uh, I realized that, that maybe there was some hope for me. You know? <laughs> like, Somebody needs was, to hear that was, today. I don't know where, where you are. but Yeah, so, it, you know, in short, it was, it was a transparency, really. It was the transparency of these men, these, these people who had walked through that, that really spoke to me. It wasn't um, people that were elevated. It was people that were right down there in the trenches, and, and they wanted to link arms with me and drive on. And so that was really what, what moved me. Yeah. Well, we're proud of what Jesus is doing in you, and thanks for investing. See, we're talking about discipleship, right? Whatever we receive... God wants us to give it away to somebody else. We can't hog it all to ourselves. So thanks for giving it away, and thanks for being available. And uh, thanks. You're going to be a great spiritual father. You're going to be a father. These guys are expecting. That's exciting. Got a baby on the way. Uh, so, hey, he's going to be a great dad. Great dad. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Jeff, get up here. I got to brag on you, too. Come on. Come on, proud of you. Another powerful testimony is coming out of sexual brokenness. And that's where Jeff came from, how God healed their marriage and healed him. Now they're getting ready to go to Mongolia and see other people healed. But guess what session you got to teach on? Sexual, pu sexual purity. All right, sexual purity. And isn't it interesting how God will use the area where the devil tried to destroy us? And then it becomes, a, instead of a stronghold of, of perversion, it becomes a stronghold of righteousness yes. where we're able to minister to other people. So, man, that, well, how, how'd that go? Normally the shoe's on the other foot. We got dad here talking from his perspective. Well, you got to share from your perspective and give guys some hope. Right. It, was, it was great. It was a great opportunity to be transparent of the darkness that I was in so these guys could see that there's a hope no matter how desperate or how hopeless that you feel. I was there. I was in that spot where I had no way out but to look up and to see Jesus. And, and I just thank God that Bishop was the one that was there that pulled me out. And because of the men of God here that surrounded me and poured into me, I'm here today to stand and to, to testify to that. So because of the DNA in this house, I'm truly and forever grateful that God can now use me. So I'm here to just testify what God did in my life for his glory and his purpose. And we're walking it out. But with Bishop and my wife, that they stood for me. They stood in that gap, and the intercessors stood in that gap. And so now I'm here to, to pursue other men to stand in that gap. Amen. To call the men to be the men of God that they were created to be. <laughs> and I just got to ask you, is, is freedom more fun than bondage? Absolutely. And is, and is helping other people get free more fun than, than being in chains yourself? Absolutely. All right, I, I thought so. I'm just setting you up for some good ads. Larry, get up here real quick if you would. Give it up for Larry O'Neill. Come on. Give a short testimony. What, what's, the, what's the big takeaway from this weekend for you? Um, I felt like uh, I was in God's boot camp. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he uh, broke me down. He left room for to fill me up. Yes. Thank God for this church, pastor, and all those men, leaders that were in that encounter. Personally, I want to thank all of you. Uh, you're a great encouragement to me, and I hope uh, that I can uh, give what I got, just like you said, give it away to others. Yeah. And I. Uh, Pray God's going to use me. I feel, uh, feel good things coming from God. Amen. I'm going to trust on that and have faith on that. Come on. And, uh, if you never went to an encounter, go. <laughs> Tommy, go. <laughs> Amen. <I love> you. <laughs> hey, how about one more? Where's Isaac? Isaac, come on up here. Isaac Carr. Come on. You had, you had some good stuff happen. Yeah. I, yeah. I brought props. <laughs> this is the key yeah the key all right so there's a couple things that they run you through one of them they let you go up and you randomly grab a key and then you ram randomly grab a prophecy two completely separate things this is this is undeniable and true meaning of awesome something of awe because it just blew me away all right my key it says i am destined i am destined my prophecy
I called you from birth with my anointing on your life. How long must you sit on the sidelines? I've called you to be a warrior, to lead other men into this fight of faith. So I say unto you, arise and watch me scatter your enemies. This weekend, you shall be my commander leading godly men. Come on. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just, that blew me away. I, I just, I've, been, I've been on the sidelines. I've been running so fast thinking that I'm doing all this work. The real battle's going on over there. And I've been on the sidelines this whole time. And so I go back to my seat and I pick up, and for you that don't know, I'm an attorney, so this thing spoke real close to me. I just opened my Bible, said, speak to me, and it said, uh, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and took it. <laughs> yeah, I can't make it up. You can't make this up. This is Luke, Luke 10, uh, 20, 25. And so he asked Jesus to, oh, and, and he said, okay, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with, thy, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. I mean, Even lawyers that's made the Bible. That's incredible. That's incredible. You did it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Proud of you. Proud of you. Now, if you're new here, that's not a recommended daily Bible reading plan, all right? We, but how many of you know God will speak to you in amazing ways because he's God and he knows how to connect the dots. He knows just what we need and he gives us just what we need when we need it. And that's, that's, that's an amazing father that we have. So thanks everybody that came and thanks for all the people that served. Um, I just want to kind of focus us in on this week too. You know, Friday is one of those days... Uh, that the whole world needs to pause and gaze upon the cross and gaze upon what Jesus did for us. It's called Good Friday. It's a paradox, isn't it? That the worst of all days would actually be the best of all days. Uh, that the sinless one, the innocent one, gave his life for us uh, in the most brutal, gruesome, horrific, demonic death ever experienced by any human being. And that's why we pause on Friday. And, and that's why it is Good Friday. We remember what he did for us. And I want to encourage you to bring your family out. These are the kind of family traditions that are good traditions where we remember together who we are. We remember what Jesus did for us. And then next Sunday, man, the greatest, greatest day in human history, Jesus Christ risen from the dead for us. Um, it separates him from all the other would-be gods, false gods, uh, players. It separates Jesus Christ clearly and forever. And, uh, and that's why we come to celebrate. So we're going to go big, all right? Those of you that don't have little children, you're in the empty nest season. I want to encourage you next Sunday, if you would, to free up your seat for a guest and come to first service. Or those of you that are our veterans, we're going to be having our overflow room used for the first time next Sunday. Uh, and so if you get here early, we encourage you to go in there and celebrate. You, the whole service will be up on the screen, the whole worship time, everything. Um, but we're believing that this place, because of you and because of your witness, is going to be packed with people that need to hear the good news of Jesus. Are you with me on that? All right. So here's what we're going to do this morning. Um, I want to encourage you on the cost of discipleship and the non-cost of discipleship. The cost of non-discipleship, let me say that differently. Cost of non-discipleship. For those of you that are new, we've been in a series now for, I think, 12 weeks uh, on uh, drop the nets. Y'all, I mean, you know, what, you've been here with me, right? We've been through this. I tried to meticulously lay the groundwork for a lifestyle of being a disciple and then making disciples. How many of you know that comes right from Jesus' lips? And it's the secret, it's the secret to taking over the planet for Jesus Christ and for his glory. We can't miss this. Every one of you in the, under the sound of my voice has been called to be a follower of Jesus. And every one of you have been called to give your life away to other people. We all in agreement on that? that the, the ability to do those two things, just two things, do them well, will determine uh, 
a huge outcome as, as it relates to God's purposes in the earth, all right? So we want to be found faithful, right? We got any fat people out here? Faithful, available, teachable. We all want to be fat people in the kingdom of God. God uses fat people. Be a fat person, all right? That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but here's what I want to do as we relate to our offering this morning. You know, the Bible talks about two different people that were challenged by Jesus to follow him. The first one is the rich young ruler. Um, and you all know the story of the rich young ruler. He's so zealous for God. He comes up to Jesus. He's so basically so proud of himself. And Jesus tells him, you know, you need to you know, obey the law. And he's, I've done it all. I've done it all. And then Jesus goes right to the idol. How many of you have found the Lord go right to the idol in your life? That one little thing that you're keeping hidden from the Lord, right? And Jesus goes right to the idol. And he says, that's great, man. He says, now I want you to sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And the Bible says the guy went away sad, right? Went away sad because uh, he realized that, the, check this out, the cost of following Jesus was too great. It was greater than he was willing to pay. There was another man in the Bible named Zacchaeus. Y'all remember him? A wee little man. And a wee little man was he. We sing about him in Sunday school. And Zacchaeus had a hunger for God. He wanted, to, he wanted to see this man, Jesus, that he had heard about. And you all know because he was small, he had to run ahead. He climbed up in a tree. The parade was coming. Jesus was the center of attention. And uh, Zacchaeus climbed up. And Jesus, by a word of knowledge and the power of the Holy Spirit, looked up at this man he had never met before and said, Zacchaeus, he called him by name. How do you know? That'll get your attention. Zacchaeus, you come down. He goes, I, I, I want to have lunch with you today. And guess what? One encounter with Jesus over lunch, rocked this man's life. And the Bible said he went back and all the people he had ripped off, all the people he had defrauded, he went back and he not only paid them back what he stole from them, but he paid back with interest. Now, I mean, you know, that was a lot of people. And Zacchaeus probably didn't have much money left when he was done. But isn't it interesting? For Zacchaeus, the cost of non-discipleship was greater than the cost of discipleship. I want you to hear me. This message today is a sobering message. It's a serious message, but it's a joyful message. I don't want you to miss the joy. Here's what's at stake. Is Jesus worthy of everything? Is Jesus more valuable than your idol? And we all have them, don't we? Do we really believe that when Jesus says, if you lay your life down, you'll find it? Do we really believe that when it comes to the stuff that we're holding on to? Your idol might not be money. For some people, their idol is money. How do you know if your idol is money? Because every time I mention the word, you get upset with me. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, some people, uh, your, your idol is relationships. Your idol might be like Jeff in his day. It might have been sex. Uh, might have been addictions that you turned to. Uh, might have been fame, esteem, whatever it is. There's lots of idols we have. But the issue is this. I'm telling you that the cost of following Jesus is a whole lot less uh, than the cost of not following Jesus. And that what's at stake when we hold back and we keep our idols and we love them more is really we expose what's going on in our hearts, um, that there's things more important to us than, than him. And I can't think of a greater week to bring that into like laser-like focus to really examine our hearts today and have a chance in a fresh way to approach the cross and to follow Jesus, which is what we're going to do in just a moment, all right? So I want to pray right now just for our, our, our uh, worship as we give right now. Lord, thank you for faithfulness here in this house. And Lord, as we sow, every, this is great. Every time we have a chance to give, we slay the idol of greed in our hearts. We just put the ax to the root of greed and we say, you will not control me. I am trusting in God Almighty. He is my source. He's my provider. So, Lord, we give in that spirit today. We want to kill all the idols. We want to destroy all the things that we look to for pleasure instead of looking to you for maximum pleasure. So, Father, bless your people now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While you're doing that, I want Gina to stand up. <laughs> Woohoo! You, you can come on up. Come on. I know you want to come up. I can read it on your eyes. Gina's back from Cambodia. We're so glad you're here. I didn't even get to hug you yet. Welcome home. Thank you. Um, you just had a little meet and greet this morning. And by the way, in your bulletin, we've had a number of you that have been 
preparing food, cooking, serving. We just want to say thank you. I know you could say thank you as well, but all the proceeds uh, for t- from today go to help Gina and her work that she's doing with the team in Cambodia. So welcome back. Can you just say hi and tell us maybe, uh, you know, something on your heart, okay. not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> Hello, church family. It's so nice to be back and to be welcomed. Um, yeah, it's so nice to see faces I know and new faces. It's incredible to see how God is working here and building his church. Amen. Um, and just know that he's doing it in Cambodia too. He's bringing them in. The harvest is coming. So I love what yeah. you were saying, at least what I heard through the grapevine. You guys have had like six new salvations in the last week or so. Yeah, we, well, five. Yeah, we had five new salvations, um, three youth and two of our team members, family members. Come on. Yeah, so it's, it's happening. Yeah, it's I love so it. cool. Love it. Yeah. And we want you to see this wonderful smiling face because every time we talk about Cambodia, put some faces with that. These are our flesh and blood, our sons and our daughters who are doing such a great job. I just love it on people, but we're glad you're home. Thank You'll be home for, here for how long? Uh, two and a half more weeks. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So make sure after the service, if you haven't introduced yourself to Gina, please do so. And if you'd love to support Gina, I'm sure she would appreciate it. And you can eat sweet stuff for the glory of God right after the service yes. for Gina's sake. All right. Good, <laughs> good, good. You. All right. Give her a hand. We love you. <laughs> also, I'm now the popcorn salesman. I do it all, folks. I can do it all. All right, uh, this is for our children's ministry, for all you popcorn lovers, gourmet popcorn. All the proceeds here are for their big trip. They're going to the Ark Creation Museum. It's going to be an amazing trip for our children. Then we got cheddar, caramel, dill, pickle, movie theater, jalapeno, cheddar. I mean, we got some crazy stuff there. Joe, you cannot touch this. It's for the kingdom. All right, all right. Jalapeno. Yeah, you're all over the jalapeno. All right. All right, get your Bibles out. Are you guys ready? Now, here's what we're going to launch into the Word. But don't go passive on me, because then we're going to launch into response mode, all right? And the response I want, and it's not the response I want, the Lord's response he wants is you. Are you with me? So you can see we're going to celebrate communion today. We're also, if I could have the guys come up and help me rearrange the stage, we're going to move the cross front and center today, because the cross is an important part of this message as we wrap up this series on discipleship. So... Did we miss, are we got the guys coming? Are the guys not coming? Who are the guys? We're, guy, if you're a guy, I need you right now. You've just, you've just become part of the team, all right? Boy, it was so smooth for a service. I just don't know what happened. Amra, help me out. Hey, Amra, let me get this down here too, will you? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stay down here. We should have practiced this. It's it's a lot harder than it looks. All right. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I'm down here with you at the foot of the cross where we all belong. Amen? At the foot of the cross. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. You know, with it being the week that it is, and of course, Palm Sunday and I mean, you know, some traditions are great. Some traditions are, are hollow. Sometimes our, our holiday tra- traditions, if we get in religion, can be hollow. I never want to be accused of hollowness or fake stuff or just being uh, religious on the outside. Palm Sunday, there's an important message here, and there's an important message as a, for us as disciples. I'm speaking to you guys as disciples today. And so let's dive into Luke's account of, of this amazing event. And begin reading in verse 36. It says, as he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the king. Some translations say, Hosanna. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. I like to go back when I read the Bible. I like to put myself in those situations. I don't know if you ever do that. I try to imagine what it would be like if I were standing along the parade route. I imagine people waving the palm branches and ripping off their cloaks and throwing them on the ground and Jesus riding in like a king into Jerusalem and the people, the multitude of people that were there shouting and praising and celebrating. And I have a question for you, all right? How did they know about this event? 
Do you ever wonder how that happened? How did they know? I mean, how did the crowd form? In other words, as Jesus is making his descent into Jerusalem, there's a massive crowd that's waiting for him. Now, if you would be a typical American, we would talk about who the campaign promoter was. We talk about the marketing campaign, right? The, the news ads that were purchased. And we talk about all the flyers that were handed out um, because you got to let people know. We talk about social media. Are you with me? Lots of ways to let people know. Guess what? They didn't have any of that stuff. How did all these people know that Jesus was getting ready to make his uh, arrival into Jerusalem? Well, I want you to turn with us to John chapter 12. We're going to find the answer because here's John's account of what happened. It says in John chapter 12, verse 9, I'm just laying some track for us here. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, now this is not his arrival to Jerusalem, this is his arrival at Bethany, the home of Lazarus. They flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. I mean, no, this does not fit. Godly people should not be trying to kill people Jesus just raised from the dead. So we have a problem here, do we not? That should not have been the response. But the priests are trying to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. And look what it says in verse 10 or verse 11. For it was because of him, meaning Lazarus, that many of the people had deserted them, meaning the priests, and began believing in Jesus Christ. And look what it says in verse 12. The next day, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. How did it sweep through the city? Because excited, passionate, joyful, expectant people were running around telling everybody a couple of things. They were first of all saying, hey, the one responsible for this incredible miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead is now coming to our town. He's on his way. Word spreads like wildfire. It says it swept through Jerusalem, and it says a large crowd of Passover visitors. This was the Passover celebration. People were in from all over, from, from near and far. They were in Jerusalem for the Passover, and look what they did. This is where we get, of course, the whole Palm Sunday phrase. They took palm branches, and they went down to the road to meet him. And if you jump down to verses 17 and 18, we read some more details. Many of the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. Verse 18, that was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. So if I ask you, why did the crowd form? Who was responsible? The crowd formed because of a man named Lazarus who once was dead and now he's alive. How many of you know people are always interested in seeing the supernatural? People have a hunger for the power of God. People want to see the power of God to change people's lives. And Jesus spent his days on this earth preaching the good news and then demonstrating the good news of the kingdom. Now, let me just tell you something. The church grows the best, not by slick marketing campaigns, trying to be something that we aren't. But here's how the church grows, because of the testimony of dead men and women who are now alive. And I'm telling you, when I come into an encounter weekend, as the women's encounter, which is only a couple weeks away, I don't know if you ladies did not get a good uh, testimony this morning of why you should come, come to the ladies' encounter, I don't know what, what more we need to do. Seeing grown men weeping, seeing men who were dead, seeing men who were trapped in sexual perversion, who are now free and ministering to others, seeing men whose hearts were crushed because of the wounds of a father, who now are becoming fathers themselves and who are able to minister to other people the love and healing and restoration. Listen to me, what the world is looking for are dead people who have been made alive by Jesus Christ. Amen. People whose emotions have been trampled on and damaged and who are full of rejection and pain and bitterness and hurt who now are able to love other people. People who were selfish to the core and it was all about them uh, and they damaged so many lives who are now selfless people who are able to love others. You know, our lives become magnets. Our lives become billboards for people who are hungry for God. And I want to tell you this, I'm not minimizing 
uh, the healing of the body. I'm not minimizing the fact that God raises people from the dead even today. And I just want to be loud and clear. We're a church that believes that the Holy Spirit is still on the move today, that Jesus is alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is still here healing people's bodies, casting out devils, breaking strongholds, and raising the dead. That's the God that we serve. I'm not minimizing any of that. But listen to me. One of the most common ways and one of the greatest greatest miracles that we sometimes gloss over is when God takes a spiritually dead person, turns them inside out, and causes them to be a Jesus lover and a lover of other people. That is a miracle. That is a miracle. And I'm telling you, people today are looking for people who have been transformed, who have been raised from the dead. Let me tell you some other reasons for the excitement here. We read it right in this passage, Luke 19. Look with me at verse 37. All of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God. Why? For the wonderful miracles they had seen. Reason number one for the excitement, this is the miracle-working Messiah that had been long prophesied about. How many of you know all the way through the Old Testament, and there are some pastors today that are suggesting we should stay away from the Old Testament. Don't you dare stay away from the Old Testament. There are some people acting like the Old Testament was less inspired or not for us, but I'm telling you, it was the Old Testament that prophesied about the coming Messiah. It was the Old Testament that showed us who this Messiah would be and what he would look like. And Jesus Christ comes, and one of the ways, and I want you to hear this, one of the ways he demonstrated that he is God Almighty and the Messiah come to save us from our sins is accredited by all of the supernatural signs and wonders Jesus did. And I don't know where you're at today. You might be here today and you might be far from God or you might be cynical. You might be wondering, well, I don't know about this Jesus guy. Let me just tell you something. The Bible leaves us without excuse as it relates to the person of Christ and to his demonstration of why he's not a run-of-the-mill prophet or religious leader, why he's the Messiah that God sent, the Savior of the world. Let me just give you an example This is John's gospel. When you get to the very end of John's gospel, he tells us why he wrote the gospel and why he included in his book the stories that he included. This is what he says. Um, The disciples saw Jesus do many miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written, what? These signs, these miracles are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And check this out, that by believing in him, You will have life. How do you have life? By the power of his name. The name of Jesus is no normal name. Attached to that name is everything that he stands for. And if you reach out in faith and grab a hold of the man Christ Jesus and you embrace him as Messiah, with that embracing comes the power of new life. Isn't that good news? There were so many miracles Jesus did that weren't even able to be recorded, the Bible says, in the Bible, because the Bible is limited in, in, in its message and space. How many of you know we have a miracle-working Messiah, and he begins with the human heart, and he works his way out, and we need to worship him as our Messiah, and that's what they were doing. They were worshiping him as, as the Savior. Secondly, I want you to see that he's a sovereign king, and they recognize this, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew's gospel says, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. How do you know? He's, he's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. This was the promise of Zechariah, the prophecy of Zechariah hundreds of years before Jesus, that this king would be different. And isn't it beautiful that Jesus doesn't come like the Roman you know, emperors coming back with this big display of power. Jesus comes riding on a donkey. I mean, this is so unfitting to a king, and yet they realize that this man is the king. Y'all remember how he got that donkey? He told the disciples, hey, go out and get me, you know, give me this beast of burden. And they're like, well, what do we do? And they, and, and they said, go up to that guy and tell him we need your donkey. I'm paraphrasing. And they go up to him, and he said, well, what happens when, when we ask him? He's going to say, well, who needs it? And you tell him the Lord needs it. Remember all that? I mean, that's a strange thing. But here's why it's not so strange. Jesus was invoking the law that was given to kings. It was what's called a royal levy. The citizen must render to the king any item or service that he might request. Jesus is claiming to be king. In other words, he's saying, he's saying that donkey and every donkey on planet earth belongs rightfully to me. Go get it. He was invoking his kingly rights. 
And the owner of that animal recognized that and released that, that animal so that Jesus could make his entry into, the, into Jerusalem that day. And lastly, and I love this, Jesus must receive praise. The Bible says in verse 39 of 40, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said this, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Well, what were they saying? And they were worshiping Jesus as Messiah and King. Stop them, stop them, stop them. And I love what Jesus says here. If they keep quiet, the stones along the road are gonna burst into cheers. Oh man, this is so good. All of creation exists to give the Lord glory. You know, you know, let me tell you why you're on planet earth. To praise God. To celebrate his goodness in your life. To honor him as your Messiah, first of all. To honor him as your king, secondly. And then to release the thanksgiving out of your heart. Jesus says, if I shut these guys up, the stones themselves are gonna have a, a, a hallelujah celebration. Um, all of nature was created to give God praise. And, uh, and that's what these guys are experiencing. Now, I want to fast forward the taper because what's happening in this picture, well, actually, let me go back a little bit. You know, this is, this is important for all of us here today. There are people here that maybe you're saying, well, you know, I've never really submitted my life to Christ and I'm still not sure and oh, no, 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 no. You know, Paul said in Philippians 2 that the day is coming when every knee is going to bow and every single tongue that has ever had a tongue, every person that's ever had a tongue, will confess with their mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. I, I don't know of a bolder statement. Who has the audacity? Who, I, I mean, I'm just being real. Who has the audacity to say that? Unless you can back it up. Every single human being that ever breathed a breath will bow their knees willingly and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. The sad thing is, for some, it's going to be too late because your pastor was just telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching good news now. The day is coming when the king is coming and you have to be ready for that moment and it, you're, it's going to be too late, but you will bow. Every rebellion, stubborn fist that's been shaken at God will open into this. And every resilient, who are you to tell me what to do, will be found on their faces, on their knees, prostrate, worshiping. But for some, it's going to be too late. Can you help me? I'm speaking mostly to disciples here today. Can we make sure we do our best to make sure we populate heaven and we rob hell of a lot of people by being dead men and women who have come to life? God forbid that people that know us, that know our families, that know our church can experience life and, and continue to live as if they don't know Christ or never had an opportunity to submit to him. We don't want that to happen. But I want to fast forward the, the picture here to, to Revelation chapter 7 because God's showing us what the end's going to look like before we even get there. And I want you to see this because it's powerful. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count. Now, my buddies in Pakistan right now are experiencing an amazing revival, and the sea of people goes on so far that you cannot see the end of the, the people in the picture. And I'm telling you, that picture's nothing compared to what heaven's going to be like. There's a day coming, and I want to dispel the myth that there's only going to be a handful of us there. Aren't you glad that the mercy of God and the grace of God is so huge that the number of people around the throne of God is so great that it says no man could number. I mean, you know, that's a lot of people. And I want you to see what they're doing here. They're from every nation and every tribe, every people group, every language. What are they doing? Standing in front of a throne representing that Jesus is king. And look what it says next. Before the lamb, which reminds us that he's the Messiah. He's the sacrificial lamb that was slain for us. So we got the lamb and we got the king, the lion and the lamb. And we see a multitude before the Lord. And there are people all different shades of skin color. I mean, you know, Jesus has this diversity thing down pat. In fact, I just want you to know that every kind of earthly diversity is ultimately fake and won't last. 
The only one big enough to pull the, the nations of the world together is Jesus. Yes. Jesus is big enough to pull all the nations together. And there they all are, all different people, groups, tribes, nations, language, colors, worshiping the Lord. And I want you to see they were clothed in white robes, which is a picture of our righteousness before God. And check out what we got in our hands. Palm branches. Does this, does this ring a bell on what we're celebrating today? I think Jesus is trying to say something. Here's what he's saying. The original Palm Sunday in the celebration was a foretaste of an amazing Palm Sunday celebration that's about to come. And now check it out. I asked you a question on the first Palm Sunday. Who was responsible for gathering the crowd? We said it was Lazarus, a dead man raised to life. Let me ask you another question. Who's responsible for that Palm Sunday celebration? Well, first of all, the initial one to blame is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. It was not Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. It's Jesus' own res resurrection from the dead. That's the game changer. You all with me on that? But, but the deeper question is this. How do all those folks find out about the party? And let me just tell you something. The invitation to discipleship is a privilege. But your vote of non-participation will not stop God's glorious plan. You just miss out on the blessing. But God's going to have, that is what's going to happen. And so here's the cool thing. We got an amazing invitation and an amazing privilege. Now, I want to show you something here. Because the disciples, as, as all of us would have, we, we messed it up. When they're shouting Hosanna, that word Hosanna means God saves. They were expecting Jesus to come and kick some butt and, and, and defeat the Romans and take his place on an earthly throne. And how many of you know Jesus tried over and over again to get the, the message across? They didn't get it. They accepted him as a prophet and they expected him to reign as a king. But Jesus is saying, it's not the way, guys, it's not going to happen the way you think. They should have got a hint with the donkey thing. Like... The pomp and circumstance wasn't really there, like, like earthly kings have. They also should have got a hint with the timing of Jesus, because that week was Passover week. And check this out. This is amazing. The very moment Jesus is making his entry into Jerusalem, all the people that are celebrating the Passover, which is why they're there, are picking out the lamb to bring into their home Leading up to the sacrifice of that lamb later in the week. And check this out. God has selected his lamb. Who's making his way into God's house. The city of Jerusalem. And ultimately into the temple. Uh, where Jesus starts cleaning the temple. You all know that such situation. And ultimately God offers his lamb. Even as the people are, are doing the Old Testament. You know picture of the lamb that was to come. So Jesus, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament, is making his way. But I want you to see that between the first Palm Sunday and the second Palm Sunday, there's some important pieces missing. Where's the parade leading? It's leading to a cross. The whole celebration, all the, yay, Jesus is the man, he's the king, he's the savior, woohoo! And they don't even realize that Jesus is moving and making his way toward the cross. Now, I want you to see this too, because I've been reading all this in light of discipleship. And how many know the Bible is so full of new truths every time we read it, if we'll just read it under the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But remember last week I told you the parable of the talents, or we talked about the parable of the talents. And I share with you, you know, when the Lord gives out gifts... He, get, he doesn't give us all the same stuff, and he doesn't give us all the same responsibility or even the same increments. He gives some people five. He gave some people two talents. He gave another guy one talent. All of them got something. You with me? And remember what we were saying is Jesus wants us to take what we've received and use it. Well, use it for what? Use it for his glory. He wants us to take what we received, like the healing we received, and he wants us to give it away. How many know freely you've received what? Freely give it away. So the whole point is use what you have. I had never seen before the context of when Jesus taught and gave that teaching. Look with me. I want to show you. This is significant. This was like, wow, I had one of those aha moments. This parable comes right before Jesus makes his entry into the city on Palm Sunday. 
It comes in Luke chapter 19, earlier in that chapter. And I want you to see why Jesus told the parable of talents. It says this, he told this parable to them to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. They were thinking he's ushering in his kingdom now, and Jesus says, I'm getting ready to tell you this parable because you got it all wrong. And let me just share something with you. The Bi- this is the tension we live in. The Bible wants us to live with a great hope and expectancy for the second coming of Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That Jesus could return at any moment, and we know he's coming back. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. But here's the other side. Some people are so checked out, I hear people say, you know, as the world gets darker, right, or culture gets darker, I hear people say, Jesus is coming soon. What we should be saying is, I hope not. Why do we want Jesus to come back to a dark culture where everybody's going to hell? We should be saying, no, we can't let him come back now because we have too much work to do. And so Jesus tells his parable, he says, to to whom much has been given. Much is going to be expected of you. And if you've been faithful with much, I'll give you more. And if you're not faithful, I will take away even what you have. And then look what he says last. And as for those enemies of mine who don't want me to be king, can I just share something with you? The kingship of Jesus over our lives is not optional. Jesus said in this parable, when he got ready to leave, there were people that didn't want him to be their king. And he called, listen to me, people who don't submit to the kingship of Jesus, the Bible says in Jesus' own words, are enemies. And I want you to see the picture here. This is at the end of the, this is what Jesus says. Bring those enemies of mine who don't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. And this is a parable. It's a picture. But listen, before Jesus makes his way into the city with all the hoopla and pomp and circumstance, he knows he's laser focused because he knows it's taking him to Good Friday and to the cross. He already knows that. And this is the parable he tells him. Guys, you're missing out. I'm telling you this because you think it's happening soon. It's not happening soon. There's work to be done. I've given you so much. I've demonstrated my life. I've showed you my power. I've mentored you for the last three and a half years. I poured my life into you. Much has been given to you. Be faithful and be fruitful. Be faithful and be fruitful because there's enemies of mine out there as well. And I'm telling you, the judgment day is coming. The wrath of God is coming. But be faithful and be fruitful. And let's see many, many sons come to know me. And then the Bible says this right after that. I want you to see this. Luke uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 27, I think it is. Right after the parable, here's, here's what the Bible says. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of the disciples. Now, here's, here's what I, I, the Lord spoke to my heart about this morning. If we were to make this the Palm Sunday parade route, we got people on this side, we're cheering Jesus on. People on this side cheering Jesus on. Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem. Here he comes. And he knows about what this week's going to unfold. He knows Friday's coming. He also knows Sunday's coming. Hallelujah. But Friday is before him. And this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus is going to the cross. He's leading the way. The Bible says, walking ahead of his. This is what I love about our leader. He doesn't just tell us what to do. He leads the way. This is a man who knows exactly that the cheers on, on that Sunday by Friday are not cheers. Their, their, their cries, crucify him, crucify him. He, he gets all this. He's not enamored by the praises of people. He has had his eyes laser focused on the cross. He knows why he's here. And listen to me. Everybody that's a disciple is following their leader. And I'm just telling you, where are we going We're going to a cross. We don't preach this anymore. We don't bring this stuff up. When Jesus said this, look with me, I'm moving ahead. When Jesus said this in Luke 
14, 27. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. I realize this is a heavy verse. Can we just pause here? How many know this is like the red letter stuff in the Bible? This comes right out of Jesus' mouth. And do you notice, it doesn't say you might have a problem, it might be a challenge. No, what does it say? You cannot. It is impossible. Do you know that when Jesus said those words in the culture and the context of his time, everybody understood what the cross was all about. Jesus wasn't the first person crucified. And he certainly wasn't the last person crucified. They understood. They're living in Rome. They, people were hanging on crosses all the time. They understand what's happening. Jesus said, if, you, if you're not willing to pick up that cross, my cross, and follow me, you can't be my disciple. What he's saying is this. There's a death sentence over your life. And can I just say this? You know, in America right now, we're, we're not living in a culture where we have literal death sentences. But can I just tell you something? We have to feel the weight of this. What Jesus was saying is this. If you're not willing to literally die for me, you can't follow me. I don't know how, how to get much more sober than that. And listen, the, the glory of it is not in the martyrdom. There's nothing holy about martyrdom. What martyrdom points to is this. There's something more valuable and someone more valuable than my life. His name is Jesus. Someone, something is more valuable than life itself. This is radical. Jesus is making the claim that he's more precious than the life he gave you. And so when he asks us to follow him, what he's saying is, you got to lay your life down. In fact, let's go to the last verse, and then we're going to worship, and we're going to respond. Look at the last verse here, Mark chapter 8. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, Notice, for my sake, that means out of our passion for Jesus and for the sake of the good news. That means we're going to join the mission of Jesus. You're going to save it. And I love this. What benefit will you gain if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? What I love is right now, I don't love it because of what's happening, but what I love is that there are brothers and sisters of ours who we'll meet on the next side, who are already paying the ultimate price. Because when they say they love Jesus, there's a cost involved. You know, I met with a pastor who has a, a Muslim man at his church who was a believer in, in a Muslim country where there was severe persecution. And uh, they started un trying to uncover the underground secret church gatherings that were happening. And... Uh, they talked about how they brought this pastor in and they said, uh, they, you know, maybe they'd bring Mike up in front and they'd say, do you know that man? And the pastor would say, no, I don't know that man. That's his brother in the Lord. That's somebody maybe he's led to Christ. He's mentored. I don't know that man. And then they begin beating him in front of you. Do you know this man? Who is this man? This guy just getting pummeled. And then they watch him cut his head off or shoot him or whatever and slaughter him. And then they bring in the next church member that's your, in your life group. And they do the same thing. Who is this man? I don't know that man. Bang, bang, bang. Uh, and they go through this amazing suffering all the while keeping their eyes on that Palm Sunday celebration that's coming and realizing we're not home yet. This is not heaven. This is not our final destination. This is the battleground. This is where God invites us to partner with his son and to be on a rescue mission that matters. This is where the cost of non-discipleship, like dying in your sin, like dying a bitter person, like dying with unforgiveness, like dying having lived a wasted life that doesn't matter. That's where the cost of non-discipleship comes into play. And I've heard of fathers who have had to watch their wives be molested and abused and their kids murdered before their eyes, all the while saying, don't you dare quit on your faith in God because I'm going to see you someday and we will be resurrected in the resurrection of our Lord and we will be together forever. That's the hope these people have. 
And then hear me, it's harder in America where we have so many distractions and so much blessings to embrace the cross and to give your life for something that matters beyond your life. You know, Jerry, when you and your son are hugging this weekend and there's a father-son answer to prayer and you're weeping in front of us, it's a picture of a dead man who got raised to life and because, because he was willing to die and to heal his marriage and to go back and love this woman and to try to do it right and to go low and say, God, change me. It was his son, Nate, who said this about his dad. I can see my dad is a changed man. His whole future and destiny and seed and seed, seed rested on one man embracing the cross. One man dying. One man coming and saying, God, I don't want to live this way any longer. Jesus, take my life. Take my life. The challenge in America is to quit wasting our lives on things that don't matter and to embrace the call to give your life away. Let's love God with all of our heart as our Savior, Jesus as our Savior, and make him our King. And listen to me, let's commit in this place to being a disciple-making church that sees heaven populated, the nations of the world brought to Christ, families discipled under the Lordship of Jesus. And listen to me, what about this coming week? What about believing God with me that there's people you know that are just waiting for you to step out of your comfort zone and say, hey, come on out and worship with us this Sunday. This is the greatest of all Sundays. And how do they know? Because you're a dead person that they know that's been raised to life. There is so much potential in this room. There is so much that hinges on your ability and willingness to lay your life down. I don't know about you, but I want to stand in heaven someday and see multitudes of people that are there because of the influence of Livingstone's church and embracing the cross and following Jesus. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand to our feet in just a moment. We're going to worship our heart out. And here's my invitation to you. That as you would feel so inclined, and don't do this as a religious thing. Do this because you're recommitting yourself to the mission and to the King of glory. But it's always great to make your way right here and to realize that's our leader. And, and for you to say, I'm following him. I'm following him. I'm following him with my life. And then we've got some communion on either side. And I encourage you, if you're a single here today, dedicate yourself as you partake of those emblems and just dedicate yourself to living full out radical for God as a single person. In fact, you have much more freedom uh, and to do that than many married people. Be radical in your singleness. If you're married and your family's here, I encourage you to come up, present yourself as a family, take communion as a family, and let's get a vision for what God's going to do through us and through this church, all right? But here's what we're going to do. We've got another 20 minutes just to worship our heart out, all right? Will you join me in that? Stand on your feet, and as you feel so inclined, make your way up here. Well, let's celebrate communion, and let's worship our way out of here today. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. And bring me to my knees, Lord.